Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I remember the summer that I did my seminary chaplaincy. It was in my mid-twenties, I had one whole year of seminary under my belt, and I had just moved to Maine for the summer. The first day of the program, we came in, we were introduced to our supervisor and our fellow group mates in our CPE group. We got our name badges and our tour of the building, and I think it might have been that same afternoon that they sent us out onto the floors to go visit patients for the first time. And the only instruction they gave us was to go in and introduce ourselves by saying, Hi, I'm the chaplain. Would you like a visit? I don't think I have to tell you that everybody in the group was pretty flabbergasted. They said, What? Can we say that? I'm not a chaplain yet. I don't know what to do. I didn't even know where I was supposed to park my car yet, and here I am supposed to call myself a chaplain. I think about that as I read this story today, because I notice that at the beginning of the story, Jesus has 12 disciples, but when Matthew names them, he introduces them as apostles. I don't imagine they spend a lot of time in training between the first sentence and the second. And just like that, in the blink of an eye, they go from being students to those sent out to cure every disease and illness, to cleanse lepers, raise the dead, and oh yeah, just one more little thing. I wonder if they too were a little flabbergasted. Matthew names these folks like we should recognize them, doesn't he? And we do some, like Peter or James or John, but who's ever heard of Bartholomew or Thaddeus? Clearly somebody's heard of Thaddeus, right? Um, others rather than being famous, are infamous. Simon, the political zealot. Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. But these are the twelve that Jesus sends out. I have to think that Matthew isn't name-dropping here to impress us or simply keeping a record for posterity. I wonder if maybe the point is that these twelve are otherwise unknown people who have no qualifications whatsoever as apostles other than that Jesus is the one who told them to go. Why these 12? Why not 12 others? What sets them apart from anyone else? If it's not their credentials, then what? It would appear that Jesus' decision to promote his students to teachers has very little to do with them and everything to do with him. He's been going around to the synagogues, teaching, preaching, healing, and he's overwhelmed by the need that he encounters. Everywhere he goes, he's faced with crowds of people asking for healing. Town after town after town is filled with them. I wonder if the towns even realized they had this many people in need. Or maybe they were largely invisible, like they're so often invisible in our own towns. Even if nobody else sees them, Jesus does. He sees that they are harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. There's an image for you. I read that, and I don't think that means they don't have anybody to lead them. I think it means they don't have anybody to care for them. That no one else can help them. Matthew says that Jesus is moved to compassion. I love that word, both in Greek and English. The English word comes from Latin, and it literally means to suffer with. And the root of the Greek verb is the word for intestines, entrails, guts. Jesus sees the suffering of these people, and he suffers with them. His heart aches for them. What he sees ties his stomach in knots. And that compassion, of course, is born of love. It's Jesus' love for these people that moves him. It's love that will not allow him to do nothing. 
He cannot walk away from them, leaving them as they are, because his love for them changes him. It demands something of him. His love costs him. You might be able to relate to that feeling, but usually it's confined to friends or family or somebody with whom we're close or connected in some way. It's much harder for us to feel true compassion for people to whom we have no relation. We can easily come up with sympathy or even empathy, but compassion is much harder to muster. We are often only willing to pay the full cost of love for people with whom we share some deep bond. But that's what's wondrous about this story, is that Jesus seems to share this bond with everyone. There's nobody who's not in his family. In this story, his compassion for the crowds, his suffering with them, changes him so that he is unable to walk away from them. And his love for his friends changes them too. It transforms them from disciples into apostles. Kind of like me on my first day of CPUA. They may not have felt ready, but it doesn't really matter because it wasn't their readiness that made them apostles. The word apostle means one who is sent. All you need to be an apostle is somebody to send you. And it was Jesus' love for his disciples and for the crowds that sent them out, that made them apostles. That's what I find truly remarkable here in this story and in the story of God as it continues to unfold in the world. Regardless of our theology, in practice, we tend to place so much emphasis on our own choice, our own ability, our own actions, to the point that we sometimes overlook or forget that everything starts with God and everything ends with God. We Lutherans especially are quick to accuse our Jewish siblings of being overly focused on the righteousness attained through works, but we, and perhaps even sometimes they, forget that the whole Jewish story is founded completely on grace. God acts first to bring the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt. It's nothing but God's love that makes them free. Love given them before they even really knew who God was. And it's nothing but God's love that transforms them from a bunch of runaway slaves into a holy nation and a priestly kingdom. God's own people, given the task of sharing that love with the rest of the world. All the laws and all the rules and all the guidelines are given out of that pre-existent love. That's what Paul means when he uses that word justified. Simply that God already loves us as family. That that love has already transformed us beyond how we could ever transform ourselves. In the transformative power of that love, everything even our sufferings themselves, like illnesses or diseases or slavery in Egypt, become cause for boasting or thanksgiving because even suffering can be redeemed. Even suffering can become a way of sharing God's love. I wonder if we maybe under, misunderstand that sometimes to think that God somehow causes or sends suffering for some greater purpose. But that would ignore the fact that the world as it is is already plenty full of suffering. God doesn't need to create any more. That's the suffering that Jesus sees in Matthew's story. The suffering that moves him to compassion and that that compassion changes both him and his disciples in a way they wouldn't have been changed otherwise. It doesn't justify or excuse the harm that's, that's occurred. But it does mean that that harm is somehow mysteriously transformed so that it becomes more than the sum of its parts. Somehow, in addition to being 
terrible and painful, it is also somehow able to reveal the glory of God. I've given up trying to explain any further than that. Today of all days, as we prepare to observe Juneteenth, as we remember the Emmanuel 9, I wonder if this mystery might give us hope. Hope that as our country continues to heal from the sin of slavery, we might look forward to a future that is more compassionate and diverse than it might otherwise have been. That we might find a unity that is deeper and fuller for having been so carefully tended through these trying times. And that we are more ready to pay the full cost of love to people around us, even if we don't share some bond of blood or family. As we wrestle with the lessons that our country has learned from the institution of slavery, from Reconstruction and civil rights, I wonder how those lessons might help us heal the harm that we still cause to our indigenous neighbors or to our queer siblings, or how we might be better equipped to deal with problems like poverty or climate change because of them. It doesn't justify anything that's happened. It doesn't make it okay or worthwhile, but it means that it's not for nothing. The mystery of redemption can give us hope for a brighter future in the face of pain because it is rooted in the transforming power of God's love, a love that is active within and among us now in this community. Who are we? Just 90 some odd people randomly thrown together on a Sunday morning. But each of us called here by Christ. We remember today that we are called as a community and as a congregation by God's love. And that it is that love that gives us our identity and our vocation. Just as it gave identity and vocation to those first apostles. God loves each and all of you enough to bring you together into this assembly. And that is not changing, even though the person standing in the pulpit is. Standing before the unknown of a pastoral transition, you can trust that God's transforming love, transforming love is what has made you who you are. And it is continuing to form you into who you are becoming. God will use the next pastor of Agnes Day to continue to form this congregation, but God will also form you through the interim pastor or pastors, through supply preachers, through pastoral caregivers, through new members who will come, not all of whom you will always appreciate, but none of whom will disappoint. Because the love of Christ poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit is still calling you here as well. How that love will change you remains to be seen. I definitely did not feel like a chaplain on my first day of CPE. After calling myself one enough times, I it did eventually start to believe it, but it took a long time, and I couldn't tell you what day that happened. One of the things that I learned in that summer is that in some ways I will always continue learning how to be a chaplain, just as I am continuing to learn how to be a pastor, how to be a Christian, how to be a human being. It's a process. And as painful as it is sometimes, I've learned to trust it because it's a process saturated in God's love. If God can transform me into a chaplain, or a pastor, and can transform that ragtag group of fishermen and tax collectors and political zealots into apostles, then I know that God will help this community become what God is calling you to be. Because God loves you. God loves Agnus Day, Just as Jesus loved his disciples. And God continues to love the world with its harassed and helpless crowds to whom we are sent to proclaim good news. 
That love is going to cost us. It's going to change us. It will always keep changing us. But I think that's good news. Because the moment we stop changing, we're dead. In one of my daughter's books, it ends with a line that says, where there is love, there is life. And where there is life, there is love. And I can't think of any better way to leave us today. Invite me to please rise as you're able and join me in proclaiming this good news in the words of our hymn, number 500.